Hello and welcome back to the Handstand Cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my co-host Mikael Christy Anson. How are things going, Mikael? Hey, how are things going? Um, same as last year, I guess. <laughs> 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 not not that too much different. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I can't really complain. Um, uh, my Christmas and New Year's was actually excellent. Uh, I was in my tiny hometown in Norway. Uh, Spending mainly time with family, just my mom and brothers, and uh, it was freezing cold uh, all Christmas. It's like minus twenty, or like it was lower than twenty-five minus for like I don't know seven to ten days or something like that. And yeah. that's in uh, Celsius for our American listeners as well, which is probably minus ninety or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's just just bone chillingly cold. Uh, uh, and like it's it's just something about the cold up there too that it just it just wrenches you. Like I was out walking a lot during during the days when it was this cold, just because it's intensely beautiful, of course. Um, yeah. And it's just like you you measure the cold below like twenty five on how much it hurts on your skin, kind of, um, <laughs> and how fast you how fast you need to put your gloves back on uh, before they just freeze to death. But I mean. It's been loads colder up there, but it was it was uh, it was really great, and went loads of just like beautiful mountain trips and all that garbage. So yeah, yeah I've seen uh, it's definitely jealous on some of your Instagram stories. It's kind of yeah, awesome. we went some nice places. That's for fucking sure. Our Christmas was a uh, yeah. We had a uh, I don't know people following as the Rona as usual, more Rona. So we reopened Ireland, and then they're basically like, oh shit everyone's just basically getting drunk and spitting in each other's faces and now we have like we went from the best in europe with the rona performance to literally one of the worst in the world bar belgium mm. so i think we need to get our work done to be the top worst best we are the best worst country for rona in the world yeah for those of you who haven't been to ireland that's what they do over there they spit in each other's faces it's kind of like it's part, not really like spitting it's more just like people need to say come here and i'll tell you something and then they <laughs> lean over and kind of spray you when they've had a few beers and then you're just like oh and they wonder why like this is the kind of thing it's like they reopen and they wonder why we have exponential growth mm. anyway so we're back in hardcore lockdown from christmas which meant we had a very quiet christmas which was kind of nice so uh that so yeah that's kind of what's up with us what's up with you guys out there in listening land <laughs> phone in right now and tell us uh, anyway, I would, I've would i got some stuff to say. So we are now on to season two of the Handstand cast. So we had a bit of a brainstorm over the thing. We took a lot of your advice. We asked some questions before Christmas or sometime around then, asking for topics and other stuff. Uh, we received some great ones, so we're going to pick up definitely some of those ideas. Thank you who submitted them. And in true circus fashion, good ideas aren't made. They are stolen. So we are stealing <laughs> your ideas and we are claiming we made them. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, other than that, uh, the big news I have, well, it's big to me, I don't, most of you won't really care, is we we weren't really charting or tr doing any sort of analytics on the podcast till recently, because we, you know, we just do it, we know people like it, and I had a bit of a look at into it over Christmas, and our podcast is charting ridiculously high around the world. We are breaking into top 20 in some of the European countries regularly. Damn. We were peaked at one one hundred and sixty on the worldwide Apple Fitness podcast. These are all in the fitness category, not podcasts themselves. Uh, Apple Podcast chart worldwide. So you know, for me, it's a bit of a thank you to all our listeners and people are sharing their podcasts and everything. Because like at the end of the day, everyone who's in fitness fancies themselves as a bit of a Joe Rogan and has a podcast. And there's a huge amount of quality fitness podcasts out there. And the fact that we in our tiny little handstand niche are peaking so high it makes me very happy that we're kind of like okay cool people like us and uh you guys like it so thank you all for your sharing your comments and all that uh, as we get started yeah, yeah so. now now we've gone mainstream and we need to go and we'll get more weird again like i mean yeah. before no, no, it's no. cool and all that <laughs> we need to go like main yeah we need to go more mainstream but then we need to start selling like what's that not what's that one goop we need to go gooping for handstands, and we do uh, hand steaming for making your handstand better. Uh, yeah. So before we go mainstream, and you can say, you know, I knew them before they were cool, and then you can be like, I knew them before they'd gone weird, and uh, started supporting our alien overlords who are coming, by the way. <laughs> uh, anyway, 
on to the topic for today is uh, we're going back to basics and today's topic is the line. What is the line in the handstand? Uh, what is alignment? Uh, what is the line more so than anything else? Do we do we know some stuff? So we have a bit of history I've looked up. We, Yeah, it's always one of these interesting things. So if I was to pose to you the question, Mikhail, what is the line? What is the line? Um, the thin line between something and something else. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, mainly... Uh, what is the line? If, if the line is one single thing, I'd say that it's uh, overhyped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because of its... Um, it, 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 it comes together with this... Um, a notion that it of, uh, or it comes together with an absolutist notion. It become, comes together with the idea that it is de facto better, um, that there is no discussion to be had on that. And it comes with uh, a bunch of other kind of connected ideas uh, to it that uh, need, I think need to be uh, picked apart and kind of analyzed for what they are and uh, then discussed m more in kind of a descriptive way in terms of like, okay, so what's it contributes with? Uh, and what does it, what can it detract from? And uh, I think that the main, how to say, the main signifier for that is um, the fact that if it was so that uh, you could not be good on your hands without uh, without uh, a line, then, then it would be completely, then it would be true. But... It's not. I mean, you cannot be good on your hands if you don't have hands. That is that is that is very relevant. That is like more relevant than the lines. If you have hands and you have shoulders, you can you can do a handstand. Then that is kind of number one. And then then the line comes down to like choices, uh, sp certain specific kind of efficiencies. Uh, but then again, as you just mentioned, history shows us that like it's it's. Uh, it's it's part of other things uh, other than it being uh, like God given. Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of these things. That I think like we have to look at first off what is an actual line. If we go to the actual this pure maths definition, now I'm sure someone's going to tell me I'm completely wrong on this, but it is a uh, two points that are connected. Connecting two points creates a line. So this is it. So if we think of the line in handstands, one of the ways to think about it, I suppose, is drawing some points on the body or atomical references and then going, okay, are these points all on the same line? So this is it. So then it's like, okay, well, we have, you know, are the, say, the main pressure point in the hand, what is stacked directly above that or very close to being above it? Have we got shoulders, wrist, shoulders, rib cage all the ribs are the midpoint of the ribs all the way down pelvis knees knees are a bit of a weird one because of hyperextension can kind of be a bit tricky there on that one and ankles and toes do they all stack up on the same vertical line this is what a lot of people mean so you kind of basically can almost score someone's handstand in terms of the federation approved line handstand <laughs> by how many of those points are exactly convergent on the line so that's kind of interesting just to think about in that concept the other thing is it's kind of the line kind of what we're looking for a lot of time to be balanced in some ways we need half the mass of the body on one side of the line and the other half on the other side so this is where we start seeing weird stacks or not not right line lines that are defined as not right because they're kind of they're not doing it in a segmented manner where every time we move up a unit of distance up the body half the mass is exactly perpendicular to either side of the line Whereas what you would see is uh, you'll see, oh, the ribs are out, and so they are on the other side of the line, and then something else further up the chain is on the other side. So it's not a 50-50 divide of the butt, say, either side of the line, but it's more the butt is on one side of the line, the ribs are on the other. And this it would then become an unfederation approved line. But I think it's one of those things, it's like, there is alignment. Alignment is one thing. And alignment in a handstand we're talking about is when we can actually manipulate. For me, it's more about learning to be able to manipulate the center of gravity in the shape we're doing so that it can align over our base of support and control it. Whereas the line is different to alignment for me. We can have alignment 
and we can see this like if we just look at contortion handstands the whole school of contortion handstand has a very good alignment a lot of people are very aligned there they're not on a line they're very curvy very fluid and it's always this kind of dissection of uh fluid curvy shapes are wrong because we have imposed them on the human body or have mm. gotten rid of them in the human body and have applied only straight line shapes you must move your joints to only 90 degrees and all this kind of shit whereas what we're looking for is to separate the difference between alignment and the line and get these concepts fixed in our head particularly when we are coaching particularly when it gets advanced as well these are a lot of things to think about yeah yeah i think it's it's like that that's the thing that i usually say about it is that it's an art it's a constructed it's an artificial concept and it's an artificial way to place your body um and it it is all I, I find it very interesting from the anthropological side of things uh, i recently got back into anthropology because um it is very fascinating stuff I used to study it before but um it is essentially just like a a rule set it's a symbol uh, like a uh the symbolism of of like what is uh, right and wrong what is like what you adhere to in terms of this this framework and and this rule set um and yeah like to to refer back to history as well like i i still remember like one of the craziest hand to hand acts i've ever seen by these two russian guys i can't i can't find it on youtube anymore it's black and white and like the the flyer basically is one of the strongest per people in his hands in history probably probably he basically yeah. just ra reps out all of the hardest things that you can do uh, in handstand like pressing from crocodile and all kinds of crap and uh, in a, through an entire act malteses you name it like it's it's ridiculous but um it's kind it's you can see, you like you see him you never see him in profile in handstands you only see him from the front and he does like legs together arm up svichka and it looks really nice from that angle but you do see the shadow and he is curving in the in he's curving his uh, his one arm and when he does the maltese as well he also curves uh, his lower back in the maltese and this guy can probably do a very straight maltese if asked to do so yeah so it's uh, if 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 this is possible, uh, then it is certainly um, something more than a, a, this de facto idea that it is better. Uh, and it's it's also I think it, it's it's quite classic. We're we're living in a society where like we do construct things out of straight lines and uh, squares and rectangles and so on uh, because architecturally like there that is effective in terms of building houses and things. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, it's it's a funny thing. Like, and there's where the anthropology comes in because we look at those things and then we kind of reimpose them on the on body thinking, uh, where like you suddenly start imagining that oh yeah, standing straight must then be better, uh, yeah. and so on. Whereas like, if you look at nature, like there are very few straight lines except like crystals and things like that. Uh, like most things curve and twirl and do all these kinds of things and and they're fine. And so I, I think that that remembering this uh, is kind of the foundational things for it and, and i see it as something that's very rarely deconstructed and i think it's it's interesting because it's like that is the thing i think also one of the reasons why we started this handstand podcast and why we're interested in handstands is not only because it's like technical and difficult and fascinating in those senses but it's it's also something that like to start looking at it and start looking for the interesting questions uh, yeah. that is for me what what is more and more fascinating is just like because it's not an interesting question whether or not it's more efficient to stand like this than like this it's not that interesting but like it what i find interesting is like okay if you stand like this how can you make that efficient for example or if a person yeah. was standing like this like how would that that make the various responses of the body happen like why is someone who's really good at contortion handstands tend to do like there is this really that's an example like it's a really good hand balancer name i think his name is kazu chan or something like that uh, yeah the mongolian uh, guy mongol yeah i think he's mongolian like very good uh uh contortionist hand balancer um yeah and it's cool with him because he he does all the flags he does all the kind of the, the standardized positions and he's of course extremely flexible but when you see him do a straight one arm you can see that he he goes more into that like his shoulder position is more contortiony than mine would be and it's very obvious to him in his context in his body that is an efficient place to be because guess what he spent a lot of time there so like 
his his one arm is is equally valid as someone else's and it's the funny thing is people will say oh yeah but he's a contortionist so it's okay yeah, yeah. well it's okay for someone else too uh, so <laughs> th then you can also make more interesting and more informed um choices on how you want to do things because it's like i don't think it should be forbidden to do things in a certain way just because like kind of the the hegemony of the straight line things is as yeah. it is yeah definitely it's kind of this is the kind of thing we have to separate out from the line it's like with Hansa, it's like all this deconstructionism it's like what is actually needed to maintain your balance and is it actually needed probably not mm. but just to segue back to that shoulder position, it's very interesting because I remember when I first started really getting into handstand, I was nerding it up hard, like a like a handstand and all this such. But I was like, okay, I just really want to figure out all these kind of things. And I remember researching in the Chinese style of hand balancing, and I was just I was just by well, research. I mean, I was just looking at every single video, keeping my hands on and dissecting them down frame by frame. And there was a change in Chinese hand balancing. So Chinese hand balancers used to change. If you go back to my I think I have a video on this on YouTube somewhere. But they used to actually have a kind of an arch in the upper back around from T1 to T4. And they'd have a kind of a closed shoulder line in their handstand. They'd still do everything. And they'd have this as their kind of default shape. And then after a certain point, there was a change to the very straight alignment. And I was kind of wondering about this, like what mm. happened? Because it was like, it was, you know, they could do everything. You'd go and see everything you'd be like okay well what's going on why is why have they gone like this uh it turned out that they'd actually gotten some russian coaches or ukrainian coaches to come in to teach them that style and then they basically swapped it overnight in one of the main circus schools to having the shoulders more open and more stacked hmm. so it's kind of interesting how it just changes as a as a meme almost that hmm. it's like okay this is our position that must be hmm. and that's kind of the interesting thing, what I find about it is, is it's an aesthetic choice to have a very straight handstand. And even if you go back to, I was looking up just this morning to confirm this. So if we go back to Professor Paolinetti and oh, his, yes. yeah, it's, you know, epic book, if you can find it online. I think we've linked it, we've talked about it a few times before. Yeah. But you can see like all his handstands are curved and all this kind of thing. And then at one page he has like, oh, the straight head through looking at thing no mention of a straight handstand because it's just assumed that he could probably do it no problem but he chose to do a curved handstand and this was like push as tall as you can and look through at your feet is basically the only advice you get on it and then try it at the wall if you find balance hard as usual and uh then you get to do the straight handstand so it's kind of interesting that this kind of straightness became the de facto one where i can't remember which other book it is has this uh dimension of like the aesthetic curving lines of the american handstand versus the straight european handstand yeah yeah i, I wonder if that is the maybe it's the york hand balancing course or that manual by em orlick or whatever his name is yeah i think those it are was kind that of one. The, the three old books and it's kind of interesting when we start like thinking about it it's also like if you go back to gymnastics culture the original gymnastics culture and physical culturism came out of military kind of fitness and preparation if you look at you know there's there's some interesting anthropology there that Mikael should get into and tell me all mm. about because i'm not going to research it where it's like the victorian era basically wanted to impose rigidness straight lines and uprightness upon the human body to get away from the curved sinuous animalistic movements of the uncultured savages mm. would be uh I'm sure. what i've heard people i've read some papers saying that or that kind of impl implication so you'd have a lot of like you know, the original physical cultures and original gymnasiums, Fran Lujic, Gian, and all these people would have a very, like, formation marching would be part of it, synchronized things where people would be standing very straight, very rigid, everyone kind of basically standing at the military attention posture. And exercise would be done like that. But then when people would handstand, this is what I find interesting, why the curved handstand became a de facto. Would they be doing curved handstands, walking, horizontal ladders, stuff like this, and they'd be in the arched handstand, Mm. But everything else they done was kind of straight. So it was a weird contrast that we're almost inverting our world. And mm -hmm. when we invert our worldview, the rules of the inverted world go out the window. Yeah, I, th I think it's also the, the fact that uh, the intuitive handstand, like the handstand that a child does, if it has no concept or idea of what else to do, it'll be random. Like it'll be, it'll be arched just because the 
the body's ability. Like we talked about before, if you pick up a box and you want to put it on top of the shelf, you're going to most likely have a want to use a little bit wider than shoulder grip, uh, shoulder width grip. And as you lift it up, you bend your arms and you likely maybe arch a little bit in your in your upper back and your thoracic spine uh, so that you can access your pecs and use your biceps and all of that as you put the box on top of the shelf. And these, this, this kind of muscular pattern is also then what you'd like to use if you st- if you just put your hands on the floor and try to kick your legs into the into the air because like your body at least knows it has some strength there like it it knows that like okay this type of position is maybe safer than another type of position and like this kind of shrugging the shoulders and placing them close to the ears and like straight arms and so on isn't isn't something that you you build up any um, habit to do through other means unless you've done then this specific physical training that we're talking about. Yeah. So that that's just like, I think that easily becomes kind of the, the, um, the default position. Uh, then you have things such as like, I mean, handstand push-ups, uh, which it relates a lot more to. And that's what you see with a lot of the old school hand balancers too. When they jump up on the canes, they do kind of a, or on hand to hand, they do like kind of a bent arm, a deliberate bent arm pressure to get up, and yeah. they're totally fine able to do that because that's what they have control. So I think there's there's a lot of that, and then like I I think I mentioned it before, but I do believe that the actual straightening out of the handstand didn't really come from handstand technique per se. I think it came yeah. more from from the wish to create dynamics efficiently as you would in gymnastics tumbling as you would in hand-to-hand uh, acrobatics when you want to do like tempos and, and dynamics and flips and all that kind of stuff because yeah. you then you then you'll be direct like your your tool for acceleration then is the opening of the of the spine and the closing of the spine and kind of the, the rib cage that's where you get the whip and the, the most perfect example of that is trying to do a round off and where you pass through a, a handstand position and at the very point where you do the corbett part of the motion where you pike and you whip the legs and you push off the shoulders, that's where you really need to move from an open position to a closed position. And unless you're really strong and really coordinated in this type of placement and the straightness of the body, that is going to be difficult. And maybe even, yeah, maybe even more clearly when you do swings on, on rings or on parallel bars or stuff like that when you really want to do giants and so on you you you, you need to be able to hold, maintain a straight body and you need yeah. to be able to drive through heels and through toes and so on and that is inefficient when when doing it uh, uh, with only kind of an arch and hence if you are working then within disciplines that are like the handstand intersects all this so it makes sense it makes sense that, yeah. okay if you get good at standing there and then, like, of course, the people that wanted, like, this was a lot of high-level sports, too. Like, the coaches wanted to understand. They researched. They found out, okay, and they saw, okay, here, you need to produce force in this angle, in this direction, uh, at this moment. Okay, well, makes sense that your shoulders need to be open to this degree. And suddenly, things become more academic and more studied, and boom, there you have it. And, and then I think that kind of fed back in into circus and, and so on. But, I mean, don't quote me on it, because this is just my assumptions. Yeah, it's kind of like if I think of some of the older circus photos, I think now I'm thinking about the 40s and 50s when you would see a lot of people doing the default straight handstand. One of the interesting things is about like a huge amount of them did not have posterior pelvic tilt. It was not, they were not aiming for this kind of caved in the front position that you would associate with a perfectly, perfectly textbook straight. They would be straight, the arm would be up overhead, but they'd still be kind of, if you're just standing on the ground positioning with everything stacked above the shoulder. So it's kind of interesting that things slowly, you know, one thing becomes the other. Your dish is your default abdominal training exercise in the circus world. So then suddenly the dish becomes the preferred thing versus the line. And then it becomes, it's a peak shift effect almost where it's like, and this is where it's got interesting is like people try to overdo the line and make it over straight. And then their handstand looks like it's arching because they have, uh, push the shoulders into off the mechanical vertical line of force mm. to get the the shoulders and the arms to be exactly hor- vertical. I know you've talked a lot about this in the past. So we've like got the, that kind of... You mean the two open? The two open. Yeah. 
And you know, I think this year I've spent more time telling people to close their shoulders mm. than I have telling people to open their shoulders. I have said, and you know, obviously it's a bit of a side effect on a lot of people in coaching. They're quite flexible, and then they're learning one arm, so they default to pushing up and back instead of pulling forward as well. So mm. uh, there is that. But I have spent a lot of time telling people to close their shoulders this year. Yeah, it's kinda... it's it's, uh, it, it's one of the things that I like. I actually had a client just recently now too that she had she had a lot of work to do on that, and her her nemesis was obviously like tuck because when she was tucking she just kept on opening the shoulders further um because that that was where her body was comfortable at at carrying weight uh and but in the end like we got we got her to 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 actually close the shoulders and she got strong there and lo and behold she pressed her hands down so i mean that that is also the the i didn't mean like if, if we're going to get more into like next like now we've been hammering a lot of oh the line this and line that and uh as if it's as if you should disregard it because but no you shouldn't uh, there are reasons to use it and for me i think one of the main reasons is the press to handstand uh, and uh, in conjunction with the press to handstand the show that the wrist health that you can um or that, that you basically don't need to lean as much forwards when you're doing presses to handstand and um, or yeah. corrections of underbalance if you if you are mastering the straight line handstand um so and and that is why that like if like basically the how to say it, the hierarchy goes like this if if all you want to do is stand on your hands then do it however you want if you want to get really really good on your hands or even like past moderately good well then you're most likely better off learning the straight because you can do the straight you can do arch as well most of the time and it'll help you towards that positioning that you need and you want when doing a press to handstand. It, uh, like having that straight line through the shoulders allows you to be using the hip flexibility as well for the press. Like if you don't have the shoulders, you can be murderously flexible in, in the hips and you still need to lean. I've seen that a hundred thousand yeah. times. Like you still need to lean loads because the shoulders can't stack regardless. Like one of my friends, she's an aerialist and she has like the craziest pancake and splits I've almost ever seen. It's just splat completely whenever. And it's, she, it, it is absolutely perfect, that flexibility of hers. And she is a million billion years from pressing to handstand because she doesn't have that strength. She can't planche and her, her shoulders can't stack in that position. And lo and behold, she goes to handstand. Well, she struggles to stack in a normal handstand as well. So it's, it's very important if you want to take handstand seriously, um, but again, if you make that choice from an informed uh, understanding, then at least you're not going to um, like you like you're you're not building dogma on something that shouldn't necessarily be dogmatic. And I guess I guess that is that's that is maybe what we're both trying to get to here. That it's it's yeah, it's really good, but it's 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 uh, it's not a god given rule by any means. Yeah, it's basically one of those things. I think when it comes to shoulder configuration which i think is basically what leads to a lot of these these alignments for me and the people i teach we have three shoulder alignments and these are the things i seek to master in people is the mexican shoulders the straight shoulders and the scorpion shoulders and obviously people have a proficiency and a tendency towards one and this will kind of dictate the skill sets and other stuff as well as thing but i want everyone to be proficient in all these three positions so that's open perfectly vertical and then closed and this gives you your basic, your whole main families of handstands and handstand alignments. So with that in mind, I think maybe it's time to talk about what are the technical parameters of the line? Like, how do we get the line? Yeah. I want to make my line good. How do I get it? Mm, yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's the starting point is, of course, uh, it, like you, you need some degree of, of shoulder mobility so that you can stack uh, the body on top of the arms without having to angle the shoulder too much forwards, nor having to move the thoracic spine uh, significantly um, to allow yourself to be on top of those vertical arms because the arms want to be vertical. And then you'd like to not need to pull your sternum away backwards towards the heel of the hand because this is this is what happens with the two open handstand is that like the arm looks completely vertical and there's like kind of becomes a like a de facto visible line from about the the, the back of the wrist to about the hips uh, 
And yeah. this is what people have a tendency to look for, like the line on the on the back of the body, whereas that isn't what you're looking for. Because that these types of handstands have a tendency either then for the ass to kind of hang over um, and then there being this micro pike or <clears throat> that yeah. the, the feet hang over. So it becomes kind of like it arches from the the low back. And this is when people tell you, tell you, close your ribs, you must close your ribs. And then like yeah. they don't understand that closing the ribs default means to close your shoulder line to some degree yeah. so uh like you 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 need to to be able to pull the sternum backwards you need to close the shoulder line to some degree which demands more power from your shoulder flexors and your trapezius to be able to maintain that position and so yeah. there's a lot of 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 the components um come from just ba the basic mobility but people have a tendency like they do this kind of drill like okay stand against the wall lift your arm to the wall okay person can lift it to the wall then you should by a bit by default be able to to do the handstand in the same position no you need to carry your entire weight and coordinate the body and the joints and so on so it's there is definitely a gap between those two that i've seen many times as well yeah there's an interesting one just you, you touched on there when people have this too open handstand where the shoulders are too open. And this can be subtly too open. It doesn't need to be massively too open. And when they don't have the mobility or the flexibility to open the shoulders correctly, the handstand arches in two different ways. And it's quite interesting. You kind of touched on it there. So with the person whose shoulders are able to achieve the line and go slightly beyond it, there there is that line from the back of the wrists, uh, from the wrist, the back of the forearm, all the way up the back. And their handstand kind of arches and the butt sticks out from about the lumbar spine somewhere, that's generally you'll see it, and then the pike and the ribs will be out on one side, people say pull the ribs down. And then if your shoulders aren't too flexible or you don't have enough shoulder flexion, or you're just not capable of physically coordinating the line, generally you will see what looks like uh, the arch generally happens in the thoracic spine mm. is one way to look at it. So it's generally that, and then if your spine's tight, it looks straight, but this kind of these are sort of clues and when you start to look at like what's going on. And it's kind of interesting with the, the two open line. This is yeah. a, the key theme this year is two open. Is if you drop that perpendicular line I was talking to through the main center of pressure, you will see about one quarter of the body is on the overbalanced side and three quarters on the underbalanced side up onto the point that arches and that changes over. So we have that kind of S curve to the body to keep the balance. So that's one of the things to look for. Now, one of the things we have to think about in the base thing of getting the line or the main section of the line is generally going to do with the lats and the pecs, mainly the lats more so than anything else in my discovery, and a bit of pec minor for most people. And this is what will allow basically to get your arms up overhead in the correct position. So this is kind of one of the key areas people need to focus on is stretching the lats out at the same time it's one of these things i've discovered or paid attention to is if we want to be hand balancers so we look at external rotation and most you know your physiotherapist comes in and checks your external rotation and he rotates you down and you have 90 degrees of external rotation and your that means your form will go down to the floor beside your head generally i've been finding that people who work overhead need a bit more they need to be able to go about 15 20 degrees beyond as a sort of baseline and that will contribute greatly to being able to get the hands up overhead. If this is the thing, if you find you're stretching your lats and no thing, and you find, oh, um, you know, work on your external rotation and get that beyond the head. You know, a, a baseline to look at is the forearm should go past the ears. If you're just trying to get a field test on this. So this is one of these things to try out. And it's one of the things that can be the limitation. The other thing is, it's like, okay, I can... You know, I can lie down on the floor or go against the wall. If you check my YouTube, I have a, a field test for handstand shoulder mobility test that will tell you what's tight. And if you can get the testing and you go, oh, everything touches the wall, but I still can't do it on handstand, then it comes down to strength and control. So mm -hmm. then it's like, oh, can I, this is where it gets interesting, the strength and control. It's like, oh, I can display a perfectly straight handstand at the wall. But then when I come off the wall, it immediately goes to shit. It's like, well, yeah what's Rapid. going on there yeah it's like okay we have a control deficit almost it's like you you know we've shown okay you can do it straight but then the body needs to do some kind of configuration arrangement to make it efficient to rebalance the body because it can't find the verticality and the straight yeah. lineness stacked in the aesthetic we want so yeah. this is 
yeah this is one of those things it's like there's much more going on to displaying a straight line it's one of the reasons i still teach it more so than anything else is because it has this nice control of flexibility strength and coordinative capacity to basically go against your body's natural tendencies yeah. in an inverted position and that's one of the main benefits is like your body's tendencies to do an arch handstand with relaxed legs feet reacting to the balance to help control it and we're going no we're going to force you to learn to do it in probably a very inefficient manner to start with mm. yeah it's it's um yeah like i i, I remember when i started teaching handstands like 10 years ago that uh it it like I remember like in my first couple of workshops I didn't have any tools for under like making people understand how to like because for for my own sake I it has never felt like I need to kind of quote unquote pull my shoulders into position like put my hands on the floor I kick up and I roll automatically on top of the shoulder where it's comfortable for me to be because that's how my shoulder is is constructed and how how it seems to always have been working. But I saw for people like, okay, it's really hard for them to get here. And I tried to just find out, okay, but what, what, what is the joint doing here to get you on top? Um, if it is not easy for you to automatically get there, uh, because I could no longer assume that it was just a technical issue, because regardless of how I explained it to several people, they would have this, the, the issue would be unsolvable technically. And I mean, the, the, the best test out of every test for this is for you know, like, if someone feels that it is extremely scary or impossible to do a tuck jump to handstand like this that i think that that's where it started for me it's like oh shit she's she she like this girl like she will it, what she's saying to me that she will fall on her face when she does a tuck up it's not a joke she will fall on her face yeah. because like when she put her hands on the floor and now standing okay i'll spot you and she's like i'm I don't dare to. And I was like, why? Uh, no, like, I feel I'm going to fall front. And then I put my, I, I jammed her shoulder with my knee and had her jump up. And she does like a massive snake jump and her shoulder goes into my knee, like significantly. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, she was obviously right. This was not what she could do at the, at the moment. But her flexibility in the shoulders was pretty good, like from, from kind of like just lifting the arm and all that stuff. And then, then I saw like, okay, but there is no, there's no there's no power in the shoulder to support her through this journey upwards. Uh, I did some tests off the tuck handstand by the wall. That was also just a no go. Well, okay, we need to find a way to strengthen this kind of alignment then this kind of flexion where the entire body's weight is resting on 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 the shoulders. Uh, and it is extremely specific, as most people that train handstands know. Like it does, it matters very little how much your can barbell lifts. It's it's highly specific to the discipline. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important to, to get uh, drilled on, on the specificities of the handstand, um, strength wise and understanding, like, I mean, just as like we spoke about in the strength episode, like if, if you cannot do a, a tuck jump to handstand and you feel that like you're going to fall on your face, okay, you need to work on your mobility and, or your strength. Uh, but there is what, what is happening de facto is that there is not enough energy from from your body in the various angles in the various muscles to carry you upwards through that range so you'll need to build that up uh, and then you can go from the other side of the aspect you increase your flexibility so that there is less energy needed to travel through this range but like no one is stopping you from working on both and for me like you can never know exactly i have loads of people like okay thought it was flexibility this one guy like i'm working with now like he had such stiff shoulders. Now it's just like, wow, he needs to stretch loads and loads and loads. And then he, I mean, he did that too, but like he didn't really, he went a little bit back and forth. And then he had a break from coaching and he came back and he's like, what the hell happened to your handstand? And I don't think he really stretched that much more. Uh, it was just like his body was slowly but surely adapting to getting strong enough in these muscles to let this pattern that we're looking for with shoulder flexion take over for, for the other pattern that is leaning more forward. So, yeah. yeah, it's definitely one of those things I've changed a lot of the shoulder flexibility training to, I don't, by a sense, I don't do a huge amount of stretching compared to what I would have done with a lot of people four, five, six, ten years ago. And now I just focus on getting shoulder flexion brutally strong. And that seems to basically get, fix most of the issues rather than like, so I'd say 80% of the training is actually just focused on shoulder flexion strength and external rotation strength in these kind of planes. And then 20% is probably, you know, classic kind of things you would associate with stretching. And that seems to work much faster for shoulders. 
other stuff is kind of 50 50 but seems to be quite a a quick way to go about it mm. so uh yeah i think we've covered the line a lot or yeah. bitched about the line a lot i i just now, like to say one more thing yeah. just about the the line as kind of a conclusive thing for my part is like also that we didn't really mention we talked about that in the physics episode so if you yeah. want to check that out go back and and listen to that for more rambles about this specifically but it's like when we speak about the line we're more speaking about the uh the um how to say the 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 the, the mechanical line where like basically where where the center of mass is in relation to your hands uh, and um how effectively you can not break your shoulder line in between those two points so like you you want to look upon like where like you you look at where is the hand where is the shoulder in relation to the hand and where is the hip in relation to the shoulder and the hand uh because like the feet are less relevant to this and you you see that with a pie handstand and a tuck handstand that like the pike and the tuck handstand can have the uh, like you'll see a perfectly straight line from hand to hip and then you see the legs piked or you see the legs tucked but the line through the body stay or like from hand to hip stays the same except it goes diagonal when yeah. when weight is moving outside the center uh, so this um this allows us to use the same set of muscles to keep the handstand the pike handstand the tuck handstand and the press to handstand but like with the same function we don't need to, yeah. to change shoulder uh, placement significantly to change between these and that leads us to the to the point that when we're doing one arm handstands where falling into underbalance will basically destroy it uh, immediately uh, it won't happen as easily because you're always using this same set of muscles the same function for lack of a better word to yeah. get the job done so that is uh, why it is efficient and Again, we've also rambled on efficiency, but it it is highly efficient to do this as you uh, you allow flexibility to play a role. You allow yourself, or you're working in a position where you you are minimizing the variables. You're minimizing the risk of destabilization of the shoulder, and you're teaching your shoulder to work and operate in a specific area rather than like, okay, I lost a bit of balance uh, into underbalance. Guess I got a planche now. Like. If that is if that is your tendency, it's going to be tough to maintain the positioning unless you're brutally strong, and uh, it can also be very taxing on your wrist to constantly have to shoot shoulders a lot forwards rather than responding higher up in the chain by the hip and keeping the stack through the shoulders. Yeah. So also, I suppose as one of the things I said before is the the straight line handstand makes your handstand volatile. It makes it changeable and this is one of the things you want so if thing is volatile if it's changeable it means it needs less energy to sort of move it around but in terms of that you actually trade against stability so the more stable something is the more energy it takes to get moving if we think of a a ball versus a pyramid pyramid on the ground you try to topple it over and roll it over very stable very wide base very narrow point it's not going to roll unless you give it a good kick and you're a giant you think of a soccer ball you lightest tap will change the direction on it is very volatile so it's this kind of thing of uh you know think of a physics ball it's got a single point of contact to a plane so it's this idea that if we get our hands down very straight we get a higher center of mass possibly the highest center of mass we can get going we get everything going and then it, when it wobbles and the perturbations of balance we can correct them very quick and very efficiently Whereas we can also sense them very quickly. Whereas in a arch handstand or a thing, is we are more stable. And this is one of those things. It's like what happens when you're learning something, you don't know what you're doing. The body wants to create stability as fast as possible. What will it do? It will default something. You put someone on something wobbly, what do they do? Lower the center mass, arms go to the side, mm. stability graded. What do we do in a handstand? If we don't have stability or the ability to stabilize or the control that goes into the controlling the volatility, we drop the center of mass so we arch somehow or we get more muscles involved to be more efficient mm. so it's this idea that uh, there's a lot going on on straight there's a lot of things worthwhile doing with it to say it is the one true handstand is completely wrong but it's a worthwhile handstand to learn I definitely suppose. cool that so was a that good is, rant 
Yeah, it was a good round. I think it was good. Good, strong start to the second season. So we have changed the format of the show slightly as well. And instead of having separate Q and A episodes, we're going to do questions and answers at the end of episodes. So if you would, uh, yeah, if you would like to send us a question, you know, DM them to us on Instagram. Use the contact form on the website. Uh, send them to me and Mikhail as well. Or you can go to anchor.fm and you can find it on the website as well. And handslandfactory.com, if you didn't know already. And uh, you can find it there and you can send us voice notes as well. And we will definitely play all the voice notes because they are cool. And it gets me to justify my equipment. <laughs> so <laughs> Keep helping so our, keep help Emmett justifying buying more equipment because that is his favorite yeah. pastime. My goal is like I need to justify buying a Sure SM7B. That's my goal. I've got a pod mic now, and I, I want it because it looks so cool. And that's the only reason I want it because it looks cool. No other reason. The mic we're using <laughs> perfectly fine. Uh, so you know, please justify this for me and my gear addiction. Uh, okay, so the first question is: For a beginner, what is more important, chasing the line or staying balanced? And that's kind of connecting directly to what we were speaking about just now. Um, I mean, they're both very important, but uh, like there isn't like there doesn't need to be a, a separation between those. Uh, I think like if I would choose, uh, I'd say that like because you're you, I, th- I, th- I think that your enjoyment from your practice should be from the doing uh, rather than the inevitable a forever long chase of perfection. So if you're able to enjoy standing on your hands and that means that you have to balance a bit of form, and I think that's important, more important. But like you, you can very simply and very easily work on both by the same time, at the same time by you work on balance. Maybe maybe let's say you're on you're freestanding, you can balance, form is a bit off, but on the wall your form is pretty good. Well, then you work on both. And then you look for the sensations you get on the wall, you strengthen yourself there, and you try to apply in the real context more and more, the better you get. Uh, just as like a kid, they learn to bike on uh, on the bike, they have kind of the support wheels on the side, they get really good at, at, at biking uh, with the support wheels, they try a little bit without them, and it's not as stable, it's, not, uh, it's more wobbly, but with practice it comes along, and then in the end you remove it, so... It's yeah. Just just take your time and work on both. Yeah, that's kind of my thought. Is like I think there's a you see this argument come up, which is more important: alignment and balance a lot, and both both are important. This is the thing: is like the handstand has balance is a separate skill. It requires some baseline of strength. But balancing is a skill in and of itself, and developing strength coordination and flexibility are different skills as well. And these things generally need to be worked on at the same time. They obviously have different importance, different stages of your training, but it's one of those things like if you, you know, the classic one that we've seen with, you know, I don't know, I suppose when handstands sort of sprung into popularity in the fitness, general fitness, CrossFit and all that kind of world, it's like everyone must get like 60 seconds chest to wall before learning to balance and people would have like five or, you know, 10 minutes chest to wall kind of stuff yet couldn't balance because they never trained the balance or the balance would just be terrible. They still have a 20 second handstand and they think they need more conditioning. Mm. They're all important. And that's the important thing here. Yep. 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 Yeah. Cool. Uh, Next one. This is kind of an interesting one, actually. Rotation of the hands. I practice with index finger at 12 o'clock. Bearing in mind, my major challenge is getting out of a banana with more elevation and external rotation of the shoulders. Would changing the rotation of the hands help? Sometimes. Uh, <laughs> mo- mo- most times I haven't really seen that significant changes happen from the hands. I think it's, uh, I think the hands often can be a little bit more of, how to say it, placebo uh, than other things. You place yeah. the hands differently and then, Ooh. oh, it worked a couple of times. Oh my, it must be because of the hands. Maybe, sometimes. Uh, try Try it out, but... It's um, yeah, it's it's highly up to the person, I would say. Yeah, it depends on how you get the rotation of the hands. Would be my answer here. It's like I can externally rotate from the upper arm rotating, or I could keep the upper arm the same way and rotate the wrist out from the lower arm. Mm. And these are two very uh, different ways of rotating the arm. If one of them, if you externally rotate the arms and from the upper arm and then place them, you end up turned out. Then yes, that could help. Maybe you're lacking some rotational range of motion in the forearm, so you could be 
you know, we do have the grip program on the website for free that has a lot of exercises to strengthen these kind of rotational directions of the forearm. Uh, it is one of those things, like I remember when I was in circus school, there was a girl there who, she was an aerialist, and she, her handstand was always kind of arched on the floor, it was always kind of banana-y, but then you would stick her onto blocks, which you would do, turned out like two fingers, and she would do, uh, what you call them, parallettes, or bars like that, and the handstand would go perfectly straight, hmm. and it was one of the strangest things to say, is like, she literally just couldn't, like, even with spotting or anything, the second you let go, she just default immediately to the arch and then you put her on to stack onto the thing or she'd just kick up and do it herself and then she'd be boom straight so mm. maybe you know that's one of those things to try if you find that uh try some parallettes maybe it could just be more skill more stretching always more stretching <laughs> so uh you know try them out and see if it helps you uh last question for today so first of all a shout out to dario who uh sent this question in and bought us three coffees uh one for one for me yeah. one for mikhail we save mikhail's coffees up by the way and just buy like oh shit. kilos of coffee powder when I you visit cold coffee here I have terrible coffee. and just uh yeah uh one for elisa who is our producer so thank you so much for the coffees i will definitely mainline them into my eyeballs at some point yeah so here's one would increasing the capacity on my chest wall handstand with proper alignment help with balancing? Talking about 120 seconds plus. Mm. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. What one of the things I like if you want to stay really long is like do 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 your set that's really long, but just do it stomach to wall. Don't touch the wall until you have to force yourself to stay longer. That is one way to look upon it. Yeah, one of the things I'd be keen to know is know what is the failure point of your handstand? What starts to burn first? Yeah. Are you losing your shoulder elevation and your protraction? Are you losing your shoulders and defaulting to a kind of closely shoulder point? Is that it? Or is it the forearm burn taking over? Mm -hmm. Or are the corrections getting super heavy? Because these are two different things to work on. It's definitely like if it is the shoulders and you're losing the alignment and the forearms are fine, then what Mikhail's saying is like, okay, cool. That would uh, that would be good because then you can go like, okay, I'll lose my balance because my shoulder line broke or something like that and I can't correct under balance. But then you can go to the wall, rest a second or two and reestablish the stack and not worry about having the balance or not worry. You can just, you know, you basically see the shoulders wobble up and down. It's what happens in beginners. You see it at the wall, it's like, oh, I do 60 seconds to the wall, but the shoulders are pulsing up and down from 30 seconds. So it's this kind of like maintaining the stack and fatiguing and building up kind of a high amount of lactate, I suppose, in there and all this stuff and just getting getting the endurance built or getting the tolerance to the burn built. Uh, the other thing that is interesting is if you find that your fingers are breaking down, then working on blocks and other stuff is quite nice because you can get longer holds but you have less demand on the finger strength and they can relax and learning how to relax the fingers and forearms during this and then it's also you know at the end of the day endurance in this kind of range is, is tied to strength hmm. getting stronger fingers is always going to help careful not to do too much it's quite easy to uh, do too much a little goes a long way in strengthening the fingers when you're trying to get a bit better at balancing and doing a hand balance practice so you know one day a day working on grip strength and just general physical grip strength, not even looking at handstand stuff, even though specific. You've covered your specific stuff, but you might as well get some, you know, grippers, you know, fat grips. Just mix it up a little. Will be there's a lot of resources online for grips. Mm. Will be my take on it. So that is our questions for today. Uh, we have gotten a lot of voice notes over the break as well, and just so everyone knows, just so you're not disappointed, we're kind of we are categorizing all the questions we've received, voice notes and everything, to start going with the episodes we have planned. So we've gotten a semi-professional. You might have noticed we have a plan. Oh what shit! We're doing. <laughs> yeah, I know we kind of have a plan and we have a schedule rather than just like turning up on the day and going, "What are we going to talk about now?" <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, some of the things coming in the next season is I'm not going to give you topics until uh, well, you know, we're going to have some more guests, we have some cool topics, some repeat topics, we're going to do some technical episodes, we're going to do some rambling episodes. It's going to be epic. Uh, other than that, I am Emmett Lewis, and I'm here with Mikhail Christiansen, and we are the Handstand Cast. Handstand Cast is brought to you by Handstand Factory. 
and is produced by Motion Impulse. Thanks for tuning in. You can find a full transcript of each episode, along with the show notes and any relevant references on handstandfactory.com slash podcast. Thanks to Isaac for editing and Jordan for transcriptions. Music by Daniel Horwath. If you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee on buymeacoffee.com or consider starting one of our Handstand Factory online programs. Links are in the show notes. <laughs>